the Indian Cultural Forum is delighted to have an extremely fine writer of poetry and prose, Murid Barghouti from Palestine. Uh, Murid Barghouti has written, in addition to poetry, two fine memoirs, the first of which, I Saw Ramallah, was described by Edward Said as one of the finest existential accounts of Palestinian displacement that we have. Thank you for being with us, Murid. Grateful to you. Thank you for having me. Murid, I thought that we will get to the poetry in stages, but I actually wanted to talk to you about the memoirs, which are no ordinary memoirs, as a context, both for your work and your life. So let me begin with uh, <coughs> the simple but extremely difficult question. What does it mean to be Palestinian? It means a lot of lost meanings. Starting from the loss of the meaning of Palestine, the loss of homeland, the loss of independence, the loss of identity, the loss of geography, and the disappearance from history. But in the same time, uh, being a Palestinian is being a person who, uh, in spite of all this, refuses to uh, turn himself or herself into uh, a problem. We are not a problem. We have problems. But when we are treated as a problem, this is the real tragedy. And this is what we are trying to explain and to avoid and to preach against. We have problems, but we are not problem. Yes, in fact, what struck me powerfully in your books is the desire for normalcy. Yes. You know, that the ultimate dream uh, is not just some large abstract yeah. um, at a kind of state level, but also looking at the details of day-to-day -day yes. life, the personal griefs yes. um, and desires. And I think in a way, you show the absence of freedom very powerfully in that way. Um, so, uh, would you talk about this personal level? You, yourself, your family have you experienced know, absence, levels of exile. Yes, the absence of freedom actually is meaningless if not uh, perceived in the context of details. The minute details, I mean. Why occupation is bad? why dictatorship is bad because they prevent you from practicing the small details of your life they restrict the move restrict the movement the language the expression the uh, traveling residence development and uh, when, when, when you are deprived of these details this is the aggression against freedom freedom I mean is not an abstract word that you are either you get it or you lose it no it's it's scattered in the details of our 24 hours that's why by living properly, by writing properly, by loving properly, by socializing properly, by moving the world, we are resisting. That's why, I mean, love becomes resistance. Decency becomes resistance. Beauty becomes resistance. Because you are attacked in order to lose your ability uh, as a human being and uh, to be turned into a problem, as I said, and a problem is good for no one. Yes. Well, it seems to me that um, this is a special thing that a writer has, and a writer like you, who's talking about mm -hmm. freedom, about politics, but not in either an abstract way or in terms of uh, 
propaganda, but you've said there's a line that struck me in I saw Ramallah that politics is the family at breakfast. Yes. Uh, so you humanize it. And I wanted to ask you about the way in which you as a writer address politics, resistance uh, to any form of um, authoritarian discourse, including the occupation, through your work. First and almost the, the the attempt to perfect what you are doing or to do it uh, with the maximum aesthetic uh, perfection is in itself an answer to injustice, is in itself refusing to be a failure, refusing to be ugly, refusing to be mediocre. By doing this, you are resisting. Refusing to be what the occupier why, uh, uh, why sees want you, you as. To be. Mm. Huh? That you are a failure, you are good for nothing, you are just a case. No, I'm not. I can fall in love, I can write poetry, I can uh, uh, have my choices, in spite of all the restrictions. That's why, I mean, a bad poem is not serving any good cause. And a great poem is serving the most difficult of political issues. Uh, so Palestine does not need, I mean, a bad poem. Well, there's an interesting dilemma here for readers and writers because uh, some tr people try to present poetry as a difficult, inaccessible form for the people, whoever they may be. But yet, we all know through history that uh, poems have inspired freedom struggles, whether in India in the past or Palestine yes. in the present. So would you talk about this, this interesting connection with the people that the poet as a question asker yeah. has? You know, when you write a poem, you don't know who is going to read it. Sometimes it is influential and felt immediately. Sometimes, after 100 years, you will find somebody carrying a line of your poem and going to the streets, making it a leading line for a revolution. This happened yes. in Tunis and Egypt. Abu al-Qasim al-Shabi mm -hmm. is a Tunisian poet who lived in the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And he died when he was 20 years old. And he left one book. In this book, there is a poem which starts, if people decide to live, then destiny will obey. The boy wrote this poem and died in 1921 or something. This line traveled from his tomb through borders, and you found the Tahrir Square in Egypt sh resounding, re with the poem. resounding with this poem. And new generations who never heard mm, of the poet himself, but they know the poem. So, I mean, beauty travels, poem travels. Not only literary theory travel, as Edward Said said, I mean. Uh, and s the role of poetry is, is really a great thing, as I witnessed it in the Tahrir Square in Egypt and in Tunisia. So a poem, if, if not, uh, if it is not, I mean, uh, important, this Sunday, it might be the most important thing, an, another Monday. <laughs> another Monday. I think that's the perfect point when um, I can ask you to read a poem for us. I, um, uh, yeah. Because your poem 
uh, must travel <laughs> to our uh, Indian viewers. Yeah, I will choose this one. It's it's called I Have No Problem. Yes. I look at myself. I have no problem. I look all right. And to some girls, my gray hair might even be attractive. My eyeglasses are well made. My body temperature is precisely 37. My shirt is ironed and my shoes do not hurt. I have no problem. My hands are not cuffed. My tongue has not been silenced yet. I have not so far been sentenced to death. And I have not been fired from my work. I am allowed to visit my relatives in jail. I am allowed to visit some of their graves in some countries. I have no problem. I am not shocked that my friend has grown a horn on his head. I like his cleverness in hiding the obvious tail under his clothes. I like his calm pose. He might kill me, but I shall forgive him for he is my friend and he can hurt me every now and then. I have no problem. The smile of the TV anchor does not make me ill anymore. And I've got used to the khaki stopping my colors night and day. This is why I keep my identification papers on me, even at the swimming pool. I have no problem. Yesterday, my dreams took the night train and I did not know how to say goodbye to them. I heard the train has crashed as in a barren valley. Only the driver survived. I thank God and I took it easy. For I have small nightmares that I hope will develop into great dreams and I have no problem. I look at myself from the day I was born till now. In my despair, I remember that there is life after death. There is life after death and I have no problem. But I ask, oh my God, is there life before death? Thank you so much, Maureen.